Welcome to Games from Folk Tales, a podcast that mixes historical research and tabletop role-playing settings. I'm your host, Timothy Ferguson. This is not your episode for the week. It's one of the little bonus episodes for Halloween week. I recorded this during the period when I had COVID, so I'm not going to talk much. Earlier in the year, or earlier in the week if you're me, three episodes were put up based on The Haunted Homes and Family Traditions of Great Britain by John Henry Ingram. Ingram was one of Poe's earliest biographers, and he was the first Poe biographer who liked Poe and didn't wish to destroy his reputation. He claims in Haunted Homes that the following story is the source of Poe's Mask of the Red Death. I can't verify that at the moment, and it's out of the scope of Maginomia because it occurs in Scotland. However, I did wish to flag it because you could place it anywhere else in either Ars Magica or Maginomia. The reader is Lorraine Carey, or L. Care, on the LibriVox forum. Thanks to them and to their production team. And now over to the story. The Haunted Homes and Family Traditions of Great Britain by John Henry Ingram, Section 121, Jedburgh Castle. Read by Lorraine Kearney. Time was in Scottish history that Jedburgh boasted of an important and even magnificent castle that was the favourite residence of royalty. William the Lion and Alexander the Second often graced it with their regal presence, but it was left to Alexander the Third to still further enhance its glory and carry its splendour to its highest pitch. Alexander the Third's reign, for clarity, was from 1249 to 1286, so well within the Ars Magica period. The childless monarch, having determined upon marrying again, ordered the wedding festival to be kept at Jedburgh, and there, in October 1285, he was united in marriage to Yolanda, or as some style her, Joletta, daughter of the Count of Dreux. Notwithstanding the high character borne by King Alexander and the universal festivity and jollification, melancholy forebodings were not wanting on the occasions of this wedding. The hilarity, indeed, of the royal host and his guests was destroyed or at all events overshadowed by a circumstance by many deemed supernatural, and of which no explanation has ever yet been afforded. The occurrence appears to have given Edgar Poe a hint, which he expanded into the tale, if such it may be termed, of the Mask of the Red Death. You'll note the author drops the Alan there. That's because Edgar Poe was his legal name. He gained Alan as a middle name, at his christening, after he was informally adopted by a couple called the Allens. The tradition of giving all three of his names hadn't quite solidified when the author was writing. Whilst the wedding revelry was at its height, a figure was suddenly observed by the startled guests gliding through their midst. In the poet's imaginative words, the figure is described as tall and gaunt, and shrouded from head to foot in the habiliment of the grave. The mask which concealed the visage was made so nearly to resemble the countenance of a stiffened corpse that the closest scrutiny must have had difficulty in detecting the cheat. Who dares, he makes the royal host demand, insult us with this blasphemous mockery? Seize him and unmask him, that we may know whom we have to hang at sunrise from the battlements. At first, as he spoke, there was a slight rushing movement of the group of pale courtiers in the direction of the intruder, but from a certain nameless awe with which the mad assumption of the mummer had inspired the whole party, there was found none who put forth hand to seize him, so that while the vast assembly, as if with one impulse, shrank from the centre of the room to the walls, he made his way, uninterruptedly, but with the same solemn and measured step which had distinguished him from the first. Ultimately, the revellers take courage, and seizing the mummer, whose tall figure stood erect and motionless, they gasped in unutterable horror at finding the grave cerements and corpse-like mask which they handled with so violent a rudeness, untenanted by any tangible form. Less terrifying, yet not the less suggestive, are the lines of Haywood, hierarchy of the blessed angels, when recounting the ill-omen tale. 
In the mid-revels, the first ominous night of their espousals, when the moon shone bright with lighted tapers, the king and queen leading the curious measures, lords and ladies treading the self-same strains. The king looks back by chance and spies a strange intruder fill the dance, namely a mere anatomy quite bare, his naked limbs both without flesh and hair, as we decipher death, who stalks about, keeping true measure till the dance be out. Nothing further is known of this spectral appearance, which had glided so suddenly into the midst of the startled revellers, and had as suddenly and as mysteriously vanished. But everyone felt that it was the portent of some great approaching calamity. Thomas the Rhymer, the famous seer and prophet, informed the Earl of March, in the presence of several persons, that the 16th of March should be the stormiest day that ever was witnessed in Scotland. Thomas the Rhymer, again for clarity, is a bard who was taken to ferry and returned, and he's able to predict the future. He left behind a series of writings, which were basically the Nostradamus of his day. I believe he's also where we get the weird idea that ferry pays a rent to hell. The day came clear and mild, and the scoffers laughed the prophecy to scorn, when suddenly came the news that the king was dead. That is a storm which I meant, said Thomas, and there was never tempest which will bring more ill luck to Scotland. The seer was right. Alexander the Third, riding in the dusk between Burnt Island and Kinghorn, was thrown from his horse over a precipice and killed in his forty-fifth year a few months after his marriage. When the sad news spread, causing distraction among the people and civil war between the claimants to the vacant throne, many thought of the dire omen which had appeared at the king's wedding and deemed that it had been sent to betoken his speedy and premature death. Your saga may vary.